How do you do? Jen and Cam feel it would be unkind to present this program without a friendly word of warning. We are about to unfold our true crime podcast, a podcast of lifelong friends who seek to examine crimes which were committed without reckoning upon God. The discussion will be frank, and the subject matter will be of a grim and violent nature. I think it will thrill you. It might even horrify you. So, if there are young children listening, or if you feel unwilling to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Well, we've warned you. Jen. Hey, Cam. What's going on? Oh, not much. How are you? I'm doing great. Anything new? I got a new stove. That's new. We can talk about that at the end. You know, it's the little things, Jen. It is. Once you get older, it's like, I got a new microwave. High five. I know. I got a broom. Yes. But right now, I got a new case for us. Or I should say, I have a new case. I don't want any of the grammar Nazis to come after me. But I have a new case. And this is courtesy. This was a listener request from our very sweet friend, Louise. And also, just to throw this in, Gary contacted us on Twitter and said he wished we would do more things in the UK. So this is for you too, Gary. This one's for you, Gary. And I believe, Gary, you also wished that we would pronounce things correctly. (laughs) That I don't know if we can do. We're trying. I hope I got this one for you. If not, you'll let us know. I wouldn't hold out any hope, Gary. Just saying. I'm, I'm trying to do better. I am. Mm-hmm. I got All you. right. So are you ready? Let's go. Yep. I am ready. The second week of 1977 in England saw the coldest January in 14 years. Low pressure carried from northern Europe brought heavy snowfall across the UK. On January 12, 1977, 28-year-old Billy Hughes was due to appear at Chesterfield Magistrate Court on charges of rape and assault. In August of the previous year, Hughes had followed a couple to a park in Chesterfield where he beat a man with a brick, then dragged the woman to the water's edge and raped her. Hughes was no stranger to the prison system, but a rape conviction could see him serve up to a decade inside. And this is really sad. He was talking to a man and woman inside the bar. They left. He followed them. The man and woman were like on a date, like a first date. And he took a brick and he hit the man, knocked him unconscious, then raped the woman. Later said, well, it was consensual. She wanted it just as bad as I did. Yeah. Horrible Hmm. man. That's going to tell you how this ends. Hughes was on remand in Leicester Prison, just over an hour away from the courthouse. Snowfall would make the journey longer than usual and a taxi was called to transport Hughes and two prison officers to the court. Hughes sat in the back, handcuffed to a guard, and the other guard sat in the passenger seat. As they got closer to Chesterfield, Hughes produced a seven-inch knife and slashed the back of the neck of a guard seated in front of him. Mm. He then plunged the same blade into the neck of the guard beside him. Hughes had been allowed to work in the prison kitchen, and so he had stolen a knife weeks earlier with the intention of using it to make his escape. And now the officers had patted Hughes down before they got him into the vehicle, but they weren't really aware of how dangerous he was. Nobody told them exactly what was going on. So the search wasn't as thorough as it should have been. I was just going to say, I thought in prison they kept count of utensils and things like that. And mm-hmm. so you'd think that they were missing. You'd one think that they knew. Yeah. And they said down. that they think they ke- he kept it in his boots. And the guards later said that when they pat him down, they, they just went around the tips of his boot and not like inside. Mm. But had mm-hmm. they have known how dangerous of a man he was, they probably would have strip searched him. Oh, yeah. After stabbing both guards, he instructed the terrified driver to keep going as the men tried to apply pressure to their wounds. Hughes managed to get the keys for the handcuffs and freed himself before telling the driver to pull over and for everyone to get out of the car. The taxi driver later said to a reporter, quote, I was told that if I did what was ordered, I would be all right. I drove for about 20 minutes before he told me to stop. 
Then he ordered us out and abandoned us. Those 20 minutes seem like hours. I don't think I'll ever be that terrified again. Hmm. In the Midlands countryside, Hughes handcuffed the bleeding prison officers and left them and the petrified driver on the side of the A632. Now, for us Americans, the A632 is a major roadway between Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. He left them on the side of the road, and then he drove off at top speed. He ignored the fact that the roads were treacherous from all the melting snow. The car slid across the road and crashed, and Hughes wasted no time in running across the moors in search of a place to hide. As police officers were scrambling to find him with the help of sniffer dogs, Hughes had stumbled upon a house that was isolated in rural Eastmoor. He made his way into a locked shed and armed himself with two axes before he approached the house. When he arrived to the house, Hughes opened an unlocked door and stepped inside the kitchen. There he was met by a terrified woman in her 60s, Anne Minton. He simply told her that he was wanted by the police and he needed somewhere to hide. He promised he wouldn't hurt her, so she let him in. She let him stay. How scary would that be? She was at the kitchen sink peeling vegetables and the back door opened. She thought it was somebody else and she turned around and there's a stranger. Wow. Yeah. And they're like, they're out. And to me, it looked like nowhere. Like Mm -hmm. it was very few houses were surrounding them. mm -hmm. Yeah. Amy's husband, Arthur, was also in the house and he didn't get such a warm greeting. Actually, Hughes hit the 74-year-old amputee and knocked him onto the floor barely giving him a chance to react. Amy and Arthur told Hughes that they shared the property with their daughter, Jill, and her family, because he had asked who else is in the house, you know. Mm -hmm. Jill and her husband, Richard, were at work in Chesterfield. Their 10-year-old daughter, Sarah, was at school, but would be home in the evening. Hughes made himself at home, going from room to room so he could be familiar with the layout before the rest of the family arrived home. Billy Hughes had no problem controlling the older couple. Arthur had a prosthetic leg after a car accident years prior, and Amy was paralyzed by the fear of thinking an intruder would harm her daughter or grandchild when they inevitably came through the door. Hughes told them, you know, don't be afraid. He assured them that everything was going to be okay, and they just needed to do what he asked them. And Jill was the first one to arrive home. Her mother tried best to contain her fear, but it was palpable. Jill later told the police that her mother had said, quote, there's a man in here on the run from the police. He's got a knife, but he promised not to harm us. Jill's own fear intensified when a knife fell from Hughes's waistband as he sat down in their lounge. And she said that Hughes had told her, quote, I've stabbed two prison officers. I did not kill them, but I know how to kill. When 10-year-old Sarah came home from school, they told her that Hughes was just waiting for a tow as his card broke down in the snow. And the little girl was none the wiser to the immediate danger until her father came home. Just after 6 p.m., Richard Moran walked into the family home and was immediately met by the sight of a man holding a knife to his wife's throat. Sarah saw the stranger hold the knife to her parents, and she shouted at him to leave them alone and just get out of the house. That was the first time she'd ever acted up. Richard offered Hughes his car keys and promised he wouldn't tell anyone that he had been there but Hughes ignored him and tied the family up one by one before carrying them into different rooms. And he would bind their wrists so tight that it would almost cut off the blood supply. Arthur tried to resist, and as he did, his prosthetic leg disconnected, and he was not able to move. For most of the next two and a half days, the family was kept apart. They were gagged and bound by their wrists and only allowed to remove the ligatures when Hughes demanded them to do something. So Two and a half days? Like two and he, a half days. He, like, I thought he was just hiding out for a little bit. Well, it was snowing, and it was cold, and he couldn't get out, and he was running, and the police were after him. There was, like, huge searches going on looking for him. So he, like, stayed there, but he would only allow them to get up and move. If he needed, he'd go, Jill, get me some tea, get serve everybody dinner, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm. Ugh. But unfortunately for 38-year-old Jill... His demands were sexual. He didn't rape her because she had told him where she was on her period, but he violated her in other ways. Jill begged to be allowed to see her daughter, but Hughes wouldn't allow it. He told Jill that he would never hurt Sarah. 
and that she was fine. She was in Amy and Arthur's room and she was just watching TV. He's lying, isn't he? Hughes said that he had a daughter of his own and that's why he would never harm or touch Sarah. By this stage, the news of Hughes's violent escape was plastered across the newspapers and broadcast on the radio. People were asked to check on their neighbors and police feared that he would take hostages. And they were warned to be very careful because Hughes was considered a very dangerous man. Mm. Let's talk about Billy. Billy Hughes. So Billy Hughes grew up in northwest of England with his five siblings. His criminal career began in his youth and he spent time in juvenile facilities and Borstal, which is like a cross between a reform school and prison. And if you remember Robert Black, who we did at the 12 Nightmares Before Christmas, he spent time at a Borstal, and they're actually closed down. They were not very nice places to be sent to, even if he were a dangerous delinquent. At first, it was just petty thefts and breaking and entering. But as he aged out of the juvenile courts, he started facing stints in adult prison. But nothing seemed to change his ways. He became dangerous. Allegedly, he killed two police dogs with his hands, and he had bitten and beaten an officer. At home, with his wife, Jean, and two girls, one of which Jean had from a previous relationship, Hughes was brutally violent. Jean had been hospitalized numerous times with broken ribs, broken arm, perforated eardrum, because Billy would beat the hell out of her. When he began to hit the children, Jean told him to leave. That's when he ended up in Chesterfield, where he committed the rape he was trying to avoid going to prison for. Once the word got out that Hughes had escaped, his wife and her daughters were taken to a refuge center or a shelter. They call it refuge center there. It's a women's shelter here. Because the police had reason to believe that he would target Jean if he had the chance. His daughter, Nicola, spoke to the Daily Mail years later and recalled being so excited while waiting for her dad to come back and pick them up. She actually thought he was coming. Mm. So she was only four years old. And she had packed all her toys that he had given her because she was so excited to see him. Nicola also remembers looking out the window of the shelter, watching it snow. And she was so worried. She remembers being so worried that her dad was out in the cold. But she had no idea her father was miles away in a house called Pottery Cottage. So after the first night under Hughes's control, Jill was forced to call her job and tell them she wouldn't be in. She also had to make excuses to her husband's employer and her daughter's school. Confident that Jill wouldn't alert anyone that he was in the house, Hughes instructed her to go to the shop for him and purchase cigarettes and newspapers. Jill did as she was instructed. Many of the papers carried the story of the escaped convict who had fled across the Derbyshire Moors, but Jill didn't tell a soul that the man was in her house holding her family hostage. She, just like a good little girl, she went in, got what she needed, and came back out. She was scared that he would harm them. I wonder if there's like a code. She Not back have. in 77. No, but I mean like like certain verbiage that she could have used. But I wonder if people would have picked that. I don't know. I don't know. Hughes made Jill cooked food and he brought the plates to her father and her daughter so they could eat. And while Jill and her mom and Richard and Hughes would sit together in the dining room and eat together. Could you imagine how awful that would have no. been? No. Uh. On the second night, he sexually assaulted her again. And the following day, he promised that he would leave. Jill asked Hughes if Sarah had asked for her comfort towel and a stuffed animal that she slept with every night. Now, I'm assuming this comfort towel, she would like roll it up. She said like a sausage and she would sleep with it that way. Mm, I'm assuming. Yeah, like a blankie. She had wondered why her daughter had not asked for this comfort towel and gray elephant because she slept with it every night. Mm Mm-hmm. And Hughes said that Sarah hadn't asked for it because she was just really happy being with her grandfather, oh Arthur. Gosh. And Jill insisted, you know, that he brings these items to Sarah. So he did, and he came back and he said that Sarah was really, really happy to see them. Hughes sent Jill and Richard to go to the shop again for supplies. They were given a list by Hughes of canned food, some soup, portable cooker, some beer, whiskey, cigarettes, and more newspapers. And before they left, Hughes told them that since Sarah had been so well-behaved, to pick her up a little something special for her, Mm -mm. which they did. They picked her out a book, I think, by Enid Boyton, 
And the shopkeeper goes, well, this is one of the expensive ones. And they're like, yeah, we don't care. Just give it to us. Wow. We need it. Richard had been badly beaten over the previous 48 hours. He insisted on alerting someone about Hughes, but Jill convinced him not to because the risk was too great. Her parents and their daughter were still at the house, and they had no way of knowing what Hughes would do if he felt betrayed. Like, they had this huge fight in the car because I know, he but wanted I to tell I would tell them. I, I, think I don't know. Jill was so sort of plan? Jill was so scared and so protective of Sarah. They had tried for years to have a baby, Richard and Jill, and they finally adopted Sarah. And so I think that she was just so protective of her that she was just going to do anything she could to. Pro- I don't know. I can't say what's in her mind. No, I know why she wouldn't tell. I mean, she was petrified. I would be petrified. I don't I, know. And she's trusting he's going to leave a thief because I, when they're together alone, he was nice. To- he was very. I can't say nice, but he was. He only bursts out to them in bursts of anger. I I'm not in her place. I can't say what I would have. I'm glad I'm not in her place. But anyway, back to the story. I guess it's not even a story, is it? Back to the back Case. to what we have here. Yeah. When they arrived back to the house, they saw Amy. She told them that she still hadn't been allowed to see her husband or Sarah. And Jill asked if Sarah could come stay with her for the night, but Hughes refused. Jill would say, quote, he became very tense. I didn't mention it again because he frightened me and I wanted to keep him happy. Hughes did agree to bring Sarah a change of clothes. And when he did, when he came back, he told Jill that, quote, Sarah was glad to have them, but she made me turn my back while she changed. Mm -hmm. And so Jill said, hearing that, that was totally Sarah. Sarah would make him do that. She was confident. Everything was fine. Mm -hmm. Hughes told them that he was going to need more money before he could leave. So they drove to Richard's place of work, and Richard managed to take some envelopes containing three employees' wages for the week about 210 pounds in total, which would be 1,400 pounds today or 1,900 U.S. Hughes finally seemed to be packing up to leave, but he wasn't going to go alone. Mm -hmm. He was taking Jill with him. Mm -hmm. He assured her that he would let her out on the way, and she reluctantly agreed only if it meant that he was away from her family. Shortly after they left, Hughes turned the car around, and he said he had forgotten something. Mm. Jill was told to wait in the car. Sometime later, he returned, and when he went to turn on the ignition, the engine failed. It didn't start. Hughes brought Jill to the neighbor's house and told her to ask them if they could tow the car a short distance so he could get it to start. Now, Hughes watched carefully as Jill knocked on the door. When the neighbors answered, Jill urgently whispered to the neighbors that her family was being held by the man that was all over the news. And the neighbor is so scary. They didn't have a phone in their house. No. So the neighbors had to get in their car to alert the police. So Jill walks back to the car. Hughes starts realizing that something's up. But just before it dawns on him, Amy, Minter, Jill's mother, walks into view outside the house. The 67-year-old woman managed to stumble towards her daughter before she collapsed into the snow. (gasps) There was blood spilling from her throat that contrasted against the glistening white snow. Hughes hastily covered the woman's body with snow before forcing Jill to crawl through soaking hedges to another neighbor's house. She didn't dare tell him what was happening as he drove him back to the car before putting a few hundred meters down on the road so it could start. Hughes didn't wait around. He drove at speed along country lanes, but the police weren't far behind. The first neighbor had managed to alert the authorities who had set up roadblocks, but Hughes simply drove towards them until they jumped out of the way. He played chicken, and he was winning. The car's tires couldn't grip the slippery roads, and the car veered into a wall. But before the officers had a chance to approach the vehicle, Hughes held a knife in the air, and then he warned them to stay back before he put the knife to Jill's throat. Hughes demanded a car full of gas, and one of the officers told him to take their patrol car. So he did. He forced Jill into the vehicle and sped off towards the village of Raynau. The police had parked a bus across the road, thinking it would force Hughes to stop, but he drove the car up onto the pavement, almost wedging the car between the bus and the wall before the car crashed and he was surrounded by police. For the next 50 minutes, he was engaged in a standoff with police. Lead investigator over the manhunt, Peter Howes, 
approached the car and tried to reason with Hughes. Hughes screamed out, warning everyone to stay back. He then picked up an axe and held it in front of Jill's face, and for the second time, he demanded a car. Hughes began to speak about his feelings and how no one cared about him, and no matter the cost, he was not going to go back to prison. The lead investigator, Howes, offered to swap places with Jill as a hostage, but warned Hughes that he wouldn't be able to outrun the police. All the while, Jill was pleading with Billy not to kill her. Mm. Howes told Hughes that there had to be somebody who cared about him. Jill chimed in, quote, He thinks a lot of his daughter. He loves her. He'd never harm her. He'd just been so good to Sarah, my daughter. House tried to tell Hughes that if he surrendered, people would be more forgiving if he'd let Jill go. Armed officers lay in wait, and the moment Hughes caught sight of them, he raised the axe, and he tried to bring it down on Jill's head. Chief Inspector House smashed through the window of the car and grappled for control of the axe. The axe hit Jill on the side of the head, but it wasn't serious. Hughes went to hit C.I. Howes with an axe. Then a number of shots rang out. The first one grazed Hughes's scalp. Another hit him in the shoulder. And with the third, Hughes slumped forward and stopped fighting. Good. He was later pronounced DOA at the hospital. Later, Jill would recall saying, quote, I never thought they had guns in England. It's like America, just like on TV. Oh, wow. It's true. <laughs> that was in the 70s, too. Jill was taken to Macclesfield Hospital, and the following morning she was told that there was no one left. Hughes had killed her entire family without her knowing. I knew that happened, but I still... Maintained ugh. hope, didn't you? The whole time you maintained yeah, hope. Yeah, I kind of, in my head, I was thinking maybe they just knocked out the little girl and grandpa with like something and they're sleeping. That's what I was hoping. It was an annex kind of house. You know, it was like the houses were kind of put together with one wall. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like a duplex. We call them yeah. duplexes here or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Officers had arrived at the house just before 9 p.m. and they managed to gain entry through a window and began walking around the family home. Richard Moran was found dead on the landing. He was still tied up and had been stabbed multiple times in the chest before being stabbed in the throat. The knives he used to inflict the wounds lay close to his body. Arthur Minton was found in a chair in the lounge of the annex, the section of the house where he and Amy lived. His body had been covered with jackets, and it had been apparent that he'd been dead for a number of days. Ten-year-old Sarah was found on the floor in the corner of her grandparents' bedroom, her hands still bound. She had been stabbed in her chest and neck, and upon appearances, the investigators could tell that she had been dead for some time. The food Jill had made for her sat untouched. Her dolly had been tucked into a makeshift bed. Amy Minton was found outside by the garage. It seemed as though she had been the last one to be killed. Her body was discovered in the blood-stained snow. Hughes apparently had killed Sarah and Arthur within hours of arriving and kept up a facade that they were alive and well for the next two days while he forced Richard, Jill, and Amy to do whatever he told them to do. Every time he had said something about Sarah, he was lying. She hadn't told him to turn around while she got changed. She didn't get the gift that he told her parents to buy for her. She didn't get her comfort toys that they had asked him to give her, her comfort towel and the elephant. She had been dead the entire time in another room of the house. People think, or it's been what I read, they think he immediately killed her because she spoke up. When Hughes took the knife for her dad, she mm -hmm. screamed, get out of my house. and. Since she did that, they believe that maybe he thought she was going to be the biggest threat. Mm -hmm. And Arthur was also the one that resisted. Him. And hearing, hearing through the wall, hearing outside, like he would need them all to be quiet. Mm -hmm. An inquest and a review had to be held to establish how Hughes had managed to escape and if his death had been justifiable. A report was released two weeks after the massacre. It found that there had been failures at Lester Prison when Hughes had not only managed to take a knife from the kitchen, but conceal it in his cell, and then on his person when he was being brought to court. Hughes should never have been allowed to work in the kitchen detail, but there was ineffective communication surrounding his history. Obviously, hello. What kind of miscommunication? They should know if they're putting him in there what his past crimes were. That you sounds like a giant human error. Mm, and that was before computers. Can you Ugh. imagine? No. 
The police also came under fire when it emerged that they failed to check the houses near Pottery Cottage, despite their seclusion making the area a likely place for a wanted man to hide out. No one had noticed the horrific happenings inside Pottery Cottage because Hughes had instilled had instilled such fear in his hostages that they were too frightened to go against his orders. Workers had come to the house on the second day to clear the septic tank, and they made small talk with Jill. And the people she'd spoke to on the phone, they didn't notice that there was anything off about her voice. Also, the shopkeepers didn't see any sign that she was being held captive by the man on the front page of the local newspapers. Amy went and cleaned the neighbor's cottage just like she normally did. And there were times when Hughes left the cottage with Jill and Richard, confident that Amy wouldn't be able to free herself and find her husband and grandchild's bodies. Hughes's death was ruled as a justifiable homicide. And Chief Inspector Peter House later received an award from the Queen for his actions in saving Jill Moran's life. House recently wrote a book, the one that I read, with author Carol Ann Lee called The Pottery Cottage Murders, and that gives an in-depth account of the crime and the sub- subsequent fallout. And it's available for purchase on Amazon, and that's where I got my copy. Amy, Arthur, Richard, and Sarah were cremated on January 21st of 1977. As the sole survivor, Jill Moran was hounded by the press who fought for an interview. She agreed to be interviewed at length by Linda Lee Potter for the Daily Mail in February of 78. And until the book by Carol Ann Lee and Peter House was published, she had never told her story again. Every person I've ever met is a star in this turbulent galaxy I call home. Some of them may have burnt out, fallen to earth, but they will never be forgotten. And I'm going to cherish every moment I have with those that are still here. Tonight, unnoticed, the fire has burnt itself out, resting now as glowing embers soon to be extinguished by the sand. It is safe to pay it no heed, as I am called to by the voices at the water's edge. Slowly, unsteadily at first, I push myself to my feet, stumble forwards, and begin to run. (laughs) Connections. This anthology audio drama is the debut production from We Talk of Dreams. Available everywhere now. Hughes was due to be buried in Chesterfield, but people staged a protest refusing to allow the mass murderer to be laid to rest in their community. There was even... Don't blame him. uh, Like, they went to... His grave was already dug, but protesters went and they were, like, shoveling the dirt back in with their bare hands because they they were just so angry and they didn't want him anywhere Mm -hmm. near them. Hughes was cremated and his ashes were presented to his estranged wife, Jean. Jean had, and her children had been allowed to leave the shelter after Hughes was shot dead. His only daughter, Nicola, later told the Daily Mail that her mother had told the police to just scatter his ashes in his second home, the police station. Hughes's uh-huh. legacy of death and destruction continued to plague his family long after his demise. Jean, who was torn between her love for the father of her child and the horror that he inflicted on her and others, struggled with addiction, and ultimately took her own life in 1998. Nicola didn't learn the truth about her father's actions until she was in her teens, and when she found out, it consumed her for the long time. She was getting teased. She was relentlessly teased about her father and mass murder. It broke my heart. and It consumed her for a very long time, and she feared that whatever demons her father had, that she would inherit them. And she attempted, she also attempted to take an overdose shortly after her mother's suicide. 
I can understand that. That would be a terrible burden. Oh, they tried and to keep it from her for so long. Yeah. Also waiting, though. Like, is that going to be my mental? Am I going to end up like that? Those yeah, are the things there was, I would be thinking. And he, yeah, I don't know. Jill Moran tried to move forward with, with her life. And in 1978, she married a man named Jill Mulqueen, who happened to be Richard's foster sister's son. Oh. Got that? Yeah. Train thought? Yeah. A year later, they welcomed a baby girl who was given Sarah as a middle name in honor of her older Aww. sister. Aww. Jill had been scrutinized by the media, and they picked apart her reasons for not alerting the police sooner. Some went as far as suggesting that she had known Hughes, and they'd planned it all out. And actually, one of the women that saw her with Hughes actually said, wow, that's, it was something to the effect with, I can't believe she's married and she's with some other man. That I mean, it's just not it didn't dawn on her that that other man could have. Yeah, I think that's human nature, though. That's not you're going to think, oh, is she cheating? I know, but not, how but how shitty is like, oh, she's married. What is she doing with another man? But also, if this, <laughs> it wouldn't if have his, even crossed my mind. His name was all over the place, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, I don't know about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, when she married Richard's technical, technically, it's her nephew, I guess. A year later, after her family's murder. People questioned that maybe she was having an affair with him before the murders. Maybe, but that I mean, they were. She was a fodder for talk mm -hmm. forever. I, plus, you have to the grief on that and the devastation would be. I don't think anybody could say what they would do or what they wouldn't right. do. Well, Jim Mulqueen told reporters that they had met at a reunion after the massacre at Pottery Cottage, and Jim was convicted of possessing a firearm with the intent and. Eight years later, and he had kind of boiled over because of all the shit talk that was mm -hmm. happening about his wife that he finally got a gun and like was shooting it in the air and he just kind of lost it. And it was all because of people talking and shooting their mouth off when they shouldn't be and the rumors and he just lost it. So he shot off the gun and he was convicted of possessing a firearm with intent and he was sent to prison for two years. Just, mm. hmm. Okay. So and once he was out, it was the early 90s, and the family picked up and moved to Ireland. And when a journalist spoke to Jill in 1999, Jill only said, quote, I've put everything behind me, and my life is very happy now. Well, good for her. I mean, that's I guess it. that's all you could do. What could you do? Unless you're yeah. going to die, too, you know? Yeah. Which they said it was only... They weren't going to tell their daughter, Jim's and hers new daughter, the one that's named after Sarah, they weren't going to tell her, but they had to tell her until she was old enough to like fully digest it. Mm -hmm. They had to tell her early because of all the shit that was going down in town. Wow. Just, you'd think that when a family suffers enough like that, that you'd not make them suffer more by idle chat. Jen, now you, I, I know you say I know. that, but come on now. You know how people are. They're, I know. People are ruthless. I, I, Let's see. Your mother and father and baby girl and husband all are brutally attacked and murdered. You're held hostage and sexually assaulted for almost days. three days. Yeah. People you're, talk. That's human nature. You've got a knife to your throat. You've got an axe to your head, which you do get cut. And yeah, people are saying, oh, she planned it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just unreal. Horrifying, I, isn't it? I, Absolutely horrifying. Thank you, Louise. I'd never heard of this before. I think, and it wasn't like 24 hours. It was days. And you're, I, I don't, who's to say what you do? In my head, the whole time you're talking about this, I was thinking about how, the codes that I could give to somebody. Mm -hmm. Like if the phone rang, I'd be like, no, oh, we want a free pizza. And they'd be like, Cam, what are you talking about? No, I don't think anybody here likes pepperoni. Well, you he know was, what I'm saying? He was listening in. At one point, they, one Dude. of the, I think Richard's friend called. And said, hey, did you hear about that loony that oh. escaped? Mm -mm. And he lost it. And he's like, loony? Did he call me a loony? And like he like went off on this huge tangent and it scared her out of control. Like so uh, she kind of pussyfoot around the whole deal, like trying to keep yeah. him happy. And uh, you know what? She probably thought he told me he was gonna get out. She wanted to believe that, and she was like, mm -hmm. Let me just do what I can do to save my family. And, then, and I think, honestly, in the back of her head, she knew her daughter was gone. She knew he did something. But it's kind of like your mind won't it. let you think that way. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's it's like coming across a dead body and thinking it's a mannequin. Your brain won't let you. You don't expect that to happen. She's doing everything she can to please him, to make him happy. And why would he betray her when she's mm-hmm. doing everything? Mm-hmm. But it's because the nature he's of the a beast. loony. That's it's why. The nature of the beast. He's going to do it. That was a good one. That's awful. I, I think that that would be one of my greatest fears to have somebody oh. come in your house, the privacy of your house. And oh. just. Well, yeah. like I, one of my, well, besides anything happening to my daughter, which check mark daughters, I should say, check mark that happened here. But somebody coming into my house, that happened too. Poor Amy at the sink. Can you imagine? Just getting ready for dinner and all of a sudden somebody walks in and you think it's your husband or you think it's your daughter and you turn around and it's a stranger that's carrying two axes. No. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Awful. I keep my doors locked all the time. But of course. Oh, I I do do too. I do too. And I get so angry when my husband leaves the garage door open because I'm like, don't. It's just Mm -mm -mm. inviting people in because we don't keep that door locked all the time. You know, I think a lot of people don't. So. Mm-hmm. Horrible. So lock your. But, uh, in addition to locking your doors, make sure you lock your garage door. <laughs> lock that. everything. But thanks, Louise. That was amazing. And Gary, I hope I did pronounce everything correctly. Sorry, Gary. I tried I bet, really hard. I bet not. But you let us know. I'm sure there's a few in there. <laughs> I'm sure they there fall is. through the cracks. Well, even bit. I have a lot of podcaster friends who are in England. So even with Eastmore, I ask them, "Is it Eastmore or Eastmer?" Or East Moo. I mean, what? I don't. <laughs> no, seriously. And one said, well, I usually say East Mua. Oh. East Mua. He goes, it just depends on where you're from. Or and some say, some say East Muir. East Moor. Yeah. So it's. I hmm. asked. I asked. I even did pronounce.com. I really think they need to sponsor us. Pronounce.com. Sponsored by our true crime podcast. <laughs> yeah. No. Anyway. Thanks, thank you. Please. Anyway, my stove, I got a new stove and I'm exciting. I'm excited about it. And the reason why I got a new stove is because my old one caught on fire and it didn't just catch on fire like I was too dirty and it needed to be clean. No, it was an electrical <laughs> fire. That That's was fun. scary. Was it inside the oven at least? Yeah, so it, it, didn't... Was, it was inside. There were flames coming from the top and I was searching and I'm like, electrical fire. Can I use the extinguisher or do I need to get flour? So I'm like looking for the extinguisher and then I'm looking for the flower and then it goes out. The flame went out. And just as the flame goes out, the smoke alarm goes off. And my daughter comes out and goes, oh, we must be having chicken for dinner because I (laughs) the smoke alarm always goes off when I make chicken. And Uh, I'm like, no, the stove's on fire. Just then my husband came up and he's like, well, the fire extinguisher's here. And I'm like, I was panicking. (laughs) <laughs> I couldn't remember. I would have too. I would have left the door shut and just hoped it all well, just went away. Well, I did leave away. the door shut. I did leave the door shut because I didn't want, you know, backdraft. That's what I was thinking. Backdraft. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. But for grease fire, you use fl- flour and then, but you I didn't. use water. I don't. know that. So, yeah, it was panic. But then I had to get a new stove. So it was fun. Does it, is it nice? Do you like it? Does it, it is nice. Well? It works very well. And it's it, nice and clean. Mm-hmm. It is Good. nice and clean. It's fantastic. And it sucks because our other stove wasn't even three years old, I think. Did you contact the company? I would think that, I don't know. No, we hmm. will never use that company. When we redid our kitchen three years ago, we got all the same brand. Mm -hmm. And each one has had a problem. And I will never use that brand again, ever. I need to know what that brand is, but you can tell me off the air. Remember when our grandma and grandpa used to talk about stuff and and they'd say, you know, the... uh, I've had Michael this for 30 it? years. Oh, my mom, we got a Whirlpool. We No, or was it a Frigidaire? I don't remember. But my mom had got a brand new washer and dryer when my brother was born in 1964. And I think it was 10 or 15 years ago that she finally replaced it. Everything, it's a throw, throwaway society now. Mm-hmm. You got to make money. So Capitalism uh, at its finest. Did you watch anything good this week, Jen? I watched Inventing Anna. I mm-hmm. finished all that on Saturday. I liked it. I was not happy that they made her so sympathetic. Mm-hmm. I also wonder, I saw a little article that piqued my interest, but I haven't gone back to read it. They said that she was paid $350,000 for her, for the Story. rights. 
is she not isn't that a profit didn't she profit mm, that, from that she's not an american citizen my dear so oh. i don't know what the rules are over yonder That's somebody true. from uh well she was born in russia and then moved to germany so i guess right. it would be i don't know where she was um she was on kick- her visa. That's why she would have to leave every three months and come yeah. back. So I don't know where. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the rules are there, but y- you would think. Yeah. And also, uh, I mm. would have totally did what Sarah, uh, Rachel did. Sold her story, too, and made money. Yeah. What? I would have had no loyalty to her whatsoever. No, I don't think it's about that. And here's my issue with that, Jen. Okay. Say, for instance, you have somebody that steals your credit card mm-hmm. and they put oh, I don't know, $60,000 on it. Right. But technically, it's your credit card, so you're responsible for it. Mm-hmm. Now, you take Rachel, who went with her, knowingly used that credit card because she thought she was going to get it back, right? Mm-hmm. And she gave permission, unlike mm-hmm. the person that didn't. Right. And then American Express okayed that, and they covered right. that. So she got all that money back. Then right. she made money off of the whole thing. But the whole... Part of it was she was crying foul, but she kind of cried foul all the way to the bank. That's the problem that people had with Rachel doing that. Um, If you watch the interview that I told you about on 2020, they also talked to Rachel and they kind of say, you know, it's you were taken advantage of. But in the end, you came out way ahead. And she did. But what I'm saying is I would have totally sold my story. I don't know if I would have cried foul, but I would have sold my story. I would have sold the rights because. Why not? That's what everybody mm-hmm. does mm-hmm. these days. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what. But American Anna Express did. should not. American Express should not have given in and given her the sixty five thousand dollars. Okay, well, that card was used on purpose, right? But that's not Sarah's fault or Rachel's fault. That it is though. She gave. She gave. No, permission. I'm saying she did. That's for American Express to forgive the- her. That wasn't Sarah's fault. Or Rachel, I'm getting them confused. That's like, not Rachel's fault. There's no Sarah Rachel, in the picture. <laughs> Rachel should have paid back mm-hmm. yeah, all the American. So you can't blame her for letting American Express take that off her. No, bill. I'm blaming American Express, and you know yeah. why. You know oh, what I'm saying. I know you hate yeah. them. But yes. um, but yeah, no, seriously, I I would have sold my story. I don't think I would have cried on stand because I was taken because she did offer that. And that's why I also watched the Tinder Swindler. Mm-hmm. Such a skeezy man that made. He that says that's not him. him. He says he's he didn't do that. It's not mm-hmm. him. Uh huh. That's why he's got a. It's an like John agent Wayne Gacy now. didn't do that and doesn't know how those dead bodies ended up in the mm-hmm. space under his house. Doesn't know. No idea. Well, now he's got an agent because of it. But America. that was frustrating, and that's why he didn't get any real time because got five months, Jen. Five months. I said real time. He didn't get no. any real time. <laughs> I'm saying that's so nothing. Five months. So for, in the scheme of things, do you think what Anna did or with the Tinder swindler guy? Which one is worse? Which one would you say was worse? Anna was scamming tend- corporations. Tinder swindler was Was, was she really? People. She, she was asking for money, but everybody fell on her to help. He was purposefully going after women and telling him they he loved them and he wanted to have babies with him and he's oh they're gonna spend the rest of their life together i need money now because the bad people are after me and i'm going to die look they beat up my bodyguard exactly look they beat up my bodyguard look they beat (laughs) he used the same video with the same ladies exactly so he emotionally damaged those women i -hmm. guess Mm -hmm. and they fell hook line and sinker for it which Hook, line, and credit card. Well, yeah, and they're still paying that damn debt off. See, American Express didn't cover them either, huh? Nope. But, but yeah, I mean, she Same just thing. asked for the money, and the men that she dealt with Well, felt- not only that, though, she stayed at all those super-duper fancy hotels and right. then would leave them high and dry. Again, so she's she is scamming corporations, corporations more than just one single person. Person. But I think Anna, too, I think, People got their feelings hurt. They don't like to be swindled. That's the problem. Nobody does. Who no, does? No, but that she hoodwinked them. So, you know, everybody thought she walked on water. And she was, I want to be friends with her. She's amazing. It's Anna, right? And then I think people also were like, you can't do that to me. I'm rich. I'm somebody. You know what I'm right. saying? So I think mm-hmm. that part of that played into that, too. But he, the Tinder swindler, whatever his name is, douchebag, douchebag McGee, He told everybody that he was wealthy, whereas Anna supposedly never did. And they just 
No, she the pretended story like around she was an heiress, a famous German heiress. She never she said she there. was until people started to talk about it. Then oh, yeah. that's when it was claimed. She didn't deny it either. She hey, never denied saying. it. She played into it, but yeah. she never denied it, nor did she tell anybody that she was. People just assumed she was. Yeah, and because so they that's how built, she, she conducted I don't know, herself. They're both wrong and they both suck. But <laughs> I hate the Tinder swindler more. Because I think it was more of an emotional racket than an actual. And I guess, I'm, okay, hurting corporations and companies is bad and it's illegal. But there's something more about targeting mm-hmm. women or an individual person mm-hmm. than it is and, about And I know that people fall Although both for that. are wrong and they're uh, both shitty and you shouldn't do either. But, I know people fall for that. But Jen, seriously, some good looking guy comes on like, like you've, come on now. How many, I'm from, I'm from Germany, I play doctor, whatever. And then it just seems like when, wouldn't some of these women kind of get, you know, he's asking for money and, you know, I, I don't know, like, maybe. He didn't, he never did that until he was, he got him. But that's what I'm saying, he but had still. Them emotionally attached. I know, but still. I, I wouldn't even take out a loan for my husband for $10,000, much less that's some what I'm guy saying. I'm just dating. I just, but I guess that's the idea. That's why they're good at that, because they can figure out who would be the victim, right? Whereas, you know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm like, I'd be like, can't you just go to the feds? Can't the feds help you? <laughs> Un- if these bad guys are after you, can't the feds loan you some money? No, no, because they're going to kill him, Jen. They're well, going to kill him. Sucks to be you. <laughs> See you on the other side. <laughs> yeah. All right. May God have mercy on your soul. Well, tonight I'm going to dig in and start the first two episodes of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel because oh, nice. I one of my absolute favorite series. So I can't wait to start that. The new one. The new one. The new okay. season three. Okay. Yeah. So, yes. I might actually go back and watch the other three or the other two before I start this one. See, that's what I was wondering. It's been that's so what, long. That's what I thought you said. So yeah, that's what I, was I love it. Remember. I think it's fantastic. The girl who plays the lead is great actress. Adorable. So yeah. yeah, the whole thing's fun. I love the costumes. I love everything. The scenes. The that's my favorite era. The forties, fifties, sixties type thing. Mid century, if you will. Hey, Jen, so do we have any promos this week? I'm so glad you reminded me. Yes, we do. This week's promo is by our friend Kevin. He does actually, his first podcast is called The Jury Room. It's great. Go listen to it. He's coming out with a new one that centers on addiction. Oh. So if you have any stories or you know anybody you want to talk to him, contact him and you can be a part of the show. But listen to the promo after we're done. He's awesome. All right. Uh, I guess uh, we'll see you uh, next week, uh, same place and all that good stuff. But until then, Jen, remember, lock your doors and your garage doors. Lock everything. Become a fortress in your house. Yeah. Make your house a fortress. But Mm -hmm. keep passing by those open windows. Uh, Bye bye. Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Jen. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at WeTalkOfDreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at Our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash our true crime podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya.
addiction. Now, the fact or condition of being addicted to a particular substance, thing, or activity. An overwhelming compulsion. As a species, we have a fascination with wanting to escape the prisons of our lives. To feel like we can dance with these toxic substances as a way to feel something different and new. We think we're always going to come away unscathed. We never expect to find ourselves addicted. This series will explore the need to escape our realities, the history of our fascination with the illicit, and to share the stories of those who have come away from the battle, war-torn and battered, but alive. Welcome to Addicted, a Jury Room production. If you or a loved one have been struggling with addiction, or have in the past, and would like to share your story, please feel free to reach out to me via social media or through email at juryroompodcast at gmail.com. Coming soon to wherever you listen to this podcast.